Okay, just just a few words because Sanjay actually did all the work and now he has to work some more to actually give the talk. Uh, although, so my name is still on there, but I didn't really do that much. Um, the uh, so this is a buzzword by itself, and we had to fulfill the need of everyone to. Oh, oh sorry, uh, everyone to actually well be satisfied with the program here. So we had to bring something. But we also, the two of us, we don't like to have some, uh, just some talk which doesn't have any content. So here yeah, actually we'll be overwhelmed with information about what it actually means, how these things work, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, in my opinion, also I think I'm speaking for Sanjay as well, so if you just would apply some program out there, some library out there which uses neural networks and you really don't understand what it means, you're in a lot of trouble because it will produce output, but you won't understand it, it won't make any sense. We don't still, even the researchers today, don't really know everything about neural networks. In fact, we don't know very little why and how they actually represent information and so on. That's, that's ongoing research. So you have to be careful. You cannot just blindly apply this stuff. So take the information which you can get here today as a little bit of an insight as to uh, how these things work and how you can approach the problem and how you can perhaps take some first steps and try to familiarize yourself with the concepts. That's the most important thing. Don't just jump in immediately, com uh, completely. And there are so many different uh, uh, implementations and techniques out there. You have to use the right one. You cannot just force your problem on a specific implementation and, and screw around with it uh, until it actually works. That does not work for you. So you will get results, but will be garbage. So it's important to listen. So and Sanjay now has more than 90 minutes of fun for you. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. I know it's Sunday and it's two hours. Um, I'm not really going to stop in between. So if you have questions, just interrupt me. Just put your hands up. Um, and like Uli said, the idea is not to cover everything about neural networks. You can't reasonably do that in two hours. So you have to skip a lot of material. And the focus here is on the guts of a neural network. How is it trained? How does it work? Some examples on toy data sets to understand what it actually does. What we won't cover, which hopefully we'll cover in future classes or future lectures, are applications. So convolutional neural nets for vision, recurrent neural networks for language, and then there are some more, more modern techniques. But this will focus purely on the guts of neural networks and training. Um, and, and before we dive into neural networks, I want to give some context. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And machine learning is basically the idea that you use statistics to understand how a system operates. So this is the, the mental model we'll use. So you know, in, in science, in engineering, we study systems. And a system is basically something like a black box that has some inputs coming in, and it does something. There are some rules or some functions, and there's some output. So you can think of the solar system and gravitation. Right? You have some planets, there's something going on, and they, the output is the motion of, or the positions and velocities of these planets. Another example is a biological cell. That's a very complex system. A third one is how memory works, how your processor works, right? or, or the network subsystem works. These are all things which are either very complex or we don't even potentially know what the rules are, but you can put inputs in and you can measure outputs. And so the central question here is, can we find out what that function, what the rules or the laws are? And we have a very good method for doing this. right? It's the scientific method, and it's very simple. It says, take some inputs, get the outputs, stare at it, try and guess what the rules are. Use your guess to predict the outputs on new inputs, and then measure the outputs. Right? So you have a prediction, and you have the actual value. If they agree, you might be right. right. You can never be sure, but you might be right. If they disagree, you're definitely wrong. That's the scientific method in a nutshell. Of course, there are some subtleties. So one, you can never prove that anything in science is correct. And by proof, I mean a mathematical proof. It doesn't exist. The sun may not rise tomorrow. 
right? I, I, there's an overwhelming possibility that it will, probability that it will, but who knows, maybe it will explode and we don't understand something about the sun and it disappears. Um, the other thing is when I said compare predictions to the outputs, that's a subtle argument, right? Like, well, what's a comparison? You have numbers coming out. Um, so usually what you do is you set tolerance limits. You say, I, I can predict the answer to within 20%. If I want it to within 1%, I have to do a lot more work. Um, and so that's the, the soft nature of comparing predictions to outputs. And the last thing is more philosophical. You want your guess of the rules, the laws, to be simple. You don't want it incredibly complicated. Now one can argue why. Because what we found empirically, you know, in physics and biology and chemistry is simple models tend to be the most generalizable. They apply to the most phenomena, I guess. Um, and so the central question is, how do I guess the rules? Of course, I can randomly guess them. Uh, the probability I'll guess the correct ones is zero, basically. So can we come up with a method to actually systematically go and figure out what rules are the right ones? And I, I have a bias towards physics, so I put three different physicists up there, so Einstein, Dirac, Feynman, of course, there are many more. And the reason I put them there is they all had slightly distinctive styles, right? Einstein used to look for consistency of the models or the theories he was creating. Feynman used to guess a lot, right? He had very good intuition. He would guess, he would look at data, and he would do it his way. Dirac was super mathematical. Everyone does it a different way. The, the key point is as long as you can guess the right rules, you're good. Um, and one way to do this is to actually look at data. You say, look, I don't want to do all the mathematics. I don't have intuition. Let me just collect a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs and stare at them or scan them and see if I can figure out exactly what's going on. How do the outputs get computed? And this was done, for example, by Kepler. Kepler observed the motion of planets and came, came up with the three planetary laws purely from data. So why, why are we talking about all this, right? Scientific method, systems, because that's what machine learning does, right? Machine learning collects a lot of data, and you have algorithms that systematically scan that data and try different rules or guesses, and they try to converge towards the rules that best explain your data. So the central problem moves from let me try and guess the rules to let me come up with efficient algorithms to try many, many combinations and see if I can systematically scan this whole space and find the right set of rules or the right candidates. Uh, and, and these algorithms, you know, you know, traditionally in complexity theory, you look at time performance, you look at space performance. In machine learning, you add a third component, which is how much data do I need? Do I need you know, n squared data to get a certain amount of precision, or do I need log n? the amount of data, and that becomes an important third question. So these are terms that I'll throw around, everyone in machine learning throws around all the time, and so I just want to define them. So if you hear this, they are completely demystified. What is a model? A model is your guess for the rules. It can be right, it can be wrong. What is learning? I mean, no one really thinks that this is how human beings learn, all these techniques. Learning in this case refers to the training process, the systematic scanning of the rules. That's called learning. And then roughly there are three categories in machine learning. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is where you get continuous feedback. You send an input to your system, you get an output, you look at your model, you update it, and you keep repeating. Unsupervised is you get no feedback, you just have some data. It can be just the outputs. I dump a bunch of outputs, don't tell you what the inputs are. And those techniques are used to actually learn the structure of what's actually going on. They're weaker. And that's a much harder problem, unsupervised learning. And there's an intermediate case, which is reinforcement learning, which is the idea of, so you, you get infrequent feedback. And the way it's generally stated is you have an agent in an environment. So think of a robot in this room. And that agent is trying to maximize some reward over time. So maybe you know, there's some very good chocolate in that corner, and there's some very cheap and bad chocolate here. And the agent can eat the chocolate here, or it can spend time and effort to find the one that maximizes pleasure. That, that whole setup is reinforcement learning. The reason I state these here is deep learning 
is used in all three, but it's not the only solution. There are classical techniques too, but there's a lot of progress in applying deep learning to reinforcement learning now. Okay, and I, so that, that's you know, machine learning in a nutshell, right? How do we guess the rules? Now, when you do machine learning in deep learning and other techniques, you often see probabilities. And the question is why? Like, why is probability showing up here? Why does it show up in statistics? So again, let's go back to our system. You have n inputs, you have an output, and this is, we are trying to guess the rules as usual. And now there can be several problems. N might be huge. So think of financial markets. You want to predict Red Hat's price tomorrow. Red Hat's price gets affected by a whole sequence of events around the world, right? Some are small, some are large. And you can't possibly list every single thing that will affect someone's stock price. There are too many factors, right? Oil prices might go up because something happens in Saudi Arabia that affects Walmart, who knows? So you can't list all the, the inputs. Even if you can list all of them, some of them might have very tiny effects. So you might not think it's actually important, and you might drop it. Or you have multiple inputs which are highly correlated but not perfectly correlated. So there are these small independent components that each effect has, and you might miss those. But the, the core point in a nutshell is most systems have too many inputs to list and to measure. And so what you're trying to actually do is you have n inputs, x1 through xn. You have the output y. This is just different notation. So these are the inputs. That's the output. And you have this function that you're trying to guess. But you don't know all the inputs. So what you're actually doing is something like this. You have three inputs, one output, and you're trying to build an approximation to the rules. And of course, you don't have all the input data. So you can only get an approximation. And so you end up in a situation like this. Imagine a box, and imagine there's a, there's a dashboard, there's a screen that prints a number. And you have three knobs, x1, x2, x3. And those are the only three knobs, right? That's the only thing that affects that box. So you go and you set x1 to 3, x2 to 2, x3 to 5, press a red button, and it pops out 3. You come back tomorrow, you do the same thing again. You do 3 to 5 again, you press the button, you get 3 again, right? There are some rules, it's doing some computation, always prints the same answer. And so that's a deterministic system. Right? That makes us happy, I know what, I can figure out what's going on. But imagine now you have a different box. It still has three knobs, but I cheated. I didn't tell you that there are seven other knobs on the other side, and you can't see it. And these knobs are loose, right? They keep moving around. So you say, OK, I'll play the same game. Fix x1, x2, x3 on the knobs. Press that red button, and you get the answer three. And you go home. You come back tomorrow. You repeat the same thing. Three to five. Press the button. Now you get four. You say, what? I got three yesterday. Why am I getting four? Say, I'll come back tomorrow, try this again. And this time you get three again. And so you do this for 10 days, and on six days you get three, on three days you get four, on one day you get one. And you say, what's going on? My inputs are completely fixed, I'm changing nothing, but I get different answers. And the answer to that, that puzzle is, well, you had no control over the seven other knobs. They're changing. So the system actually sees its in inputs change. It's saying three inputs are always fixed, but the other seven are doing something else. And so because the inputs are changing, you get different answers. But you can't see those seven inputs. And so that means if you have incomplete knowledge about a system, if you don't know all the inputs, you always end up with probabilities. You get some variance in the results. And so in your mind, if you see any system and you say, look, I can't completely describe this, you will end up doing something that's probabilistic. That's why almost every machine learning technique has probability built in, or there are ways to add probability on the top to always give you estimates and uncertainties. And this is good, right? If this was not the case, if we didn't know how to work with probabilities, imagine how, much, how many systems you could study, almost none. Almost everything has too many factors. If you're trying to predict memory usage because of some process, and it said, well, no, I need to know every single thing. I need to know the architecture of the processor. I need to know exactly what metal was used in the, uh, you know, what, what type of silicon, what metal was used in the wires, all that stuff. You'll never get anywhere. So you say, you know what, I can't control that. 
That's a prob that adds some probability, some incomplete knowledge. I can still work with this. So finally, why you're here, so that's machine learning and probability in a nutshell. And now what's a neural network? So we said earlier that we need to come up with algorithms that can efficiently scan the guess for the rules. And there are many techniques. You might have heard of many of these. So you have random forests, you have decision trees, you have k-means clustering, you have um, gradient-boosted trees, all kinds of fancy names. Neural networks are just one more of these. Right? So it's another way of efficiently scanning your search space to try and figure out the rules. So why focus on these, right? Why not the other ones? Because they have had spectacular success in computer vision tasks in the last seven, eight years. Language tasks, so automatic translation of languages, speech to text, um, and even, like I said, reinforcement learning. So you can take Atari games and train an agent to play those games very well. Of course, there are limitations too, and this is a, an area of active research. Uh, and the key thing is they're very flexible learners. In other words, they can learn many kinds of rules. You can give it many different systems and it will figure out what the rules are. And of course, these are slightly less important points for application-oriented uh, interest, but there are many open research problems, both on a mathematical level and on an applied level. Um, and there's, we won't talk about this in this, in this lecture, but there's been new progress in something called generative adversarial networks. Um, basically, you can learn the correlational structure of high-dimensional data very well. Uh, people also have been using these for discrete optimization, combinatorial optimization. That's generally a bad idea. We have very efficient techniques for doing that, but it's still an interesting research problem. Can a neural network actually do high-dimensional optimization like traveling salesman problems? And of course, there's, you know, other, there are many other applications, visualization of high-dimensional data, many other things. Um, so what is a neural network? The neural part gives you a hint. It comes from neuroscience. Uh, the idea is our brain has these cells called neurons, and I know nothing about biology, but it looks like that. So I think of myelin sheath as insulation, for example. So I have like electrical analogies for all this. And this will make a neuroscientist cringe. We really don't go deep into what neuroscience is, right? Most people who work in this field don't know anything about that. Uh, so you abstract this out. You say a neuron is a, is a circle which takes an input and gives me an output. And by input and output, I mean it takes a number and gives me a number. Um, more precisely, it takes a number that comes in. It compares it to a threshold that's tied to the neuron. It, if the number is higher than the threshold, it outputs a one. If the number is less than a threshold, it outputs a zero. So it's a switch, right? It has a threshold. If you give me something higher, I'll give you one. If you give me something lower, I'll give you a zero. Of course, that's too restrictive. You don't want just one input. So instead, you say, what if I have n inputs, i1 through in? So if you give me n inputs, and I still want one number to come out, what do I do? So you say, look, I already tied a threshold to the neuron, to the you know, sometimes it's called a neuron, sometimes it's called a node. So if I say either one, what I mean is the same thing. Um, so I already have this threshold tied to it. Why don't I also put weights on all these incoming edges? Weights are numbers, right? So these are these Ws. So you say take each input, multiply it by a weight. So you have W1 times I1. Do it for each one, add it up. So it's a weighted sum or a linear combination. And instead of comparing the original input, let me compare this whole number that I just generated to the threshold. So I take this weighted sum of all the inputs, compare it to my threshold. If it's higher, I give you a one. If it's lower, I give you a zero. And then just put them in a network, right? Connect a bunch of these. So the structure here is you have four inputs. Imagine just one of these nodes. All it sees is four incoming lines, and it has weights on those. And it takes each input, multiplies it by a weight, adds it up, compares to a threshold that, it's, that it is tied to. The second neuron does the same thing. The third one does the same thing. And then the last one, there are four outputs. They do the same thing, but instead of looking at the inputs, they look at what these three neurons send it. 
right? So each neuron looks back, says, who are my inputs? Take a weighted sum, compare to the threshold, and send my output out. That's basically a neural network. And the data flows from left to right. The inputs come from the left, does all this stuff, sends outputs out. And this is often called the feed-forward architecture because you're feeding data forward. Uh, it's, it's put in these boxes, these layers. So each vertical line is called a layer. This is the input layer because all the input comes there. This is often called the hidden layer. This is called the output layer. And deep learning, the deep word comes from many hidden layers. So modern neural networks have tens or hundreds of hidden layers uh, nowadays. So you look at this and you say, this is some arbitrary game. You just invented some neuron. You just put them in a network and you tell me, you know, throw data in and see what happens. Why is this useful? Right? Why can't I just go and do regression? Why can't I do uh, random forests? And the answer to that is something called the universal approximation theorem. What it loosely says is, given any reasonable function, and we'll define that more precisely, but given any reasonable function, f, and remember, f is always eventually our guess for the rules, right? The laws that the system obeys. But in this case, it's some mathematical function. I can approximate it to an arbitrarily high accuracy by using a neural network. So every machine learning algorithm has its restrictions. It can't learn every function. Neural networks are very flexible. So they can learn almost anything with as high an accuracy as you want. And again, this is not meant to be notational over, uh, overload. It's just, you know, this is reference. What it says is, if you take a function f, right, the one at the bottom, the one that I'm trying to learn, and let's assume for simplicity that instead of taking any real input and mapping it to a real output, it takes n numbers between 0 and 1. That's what this notation means, the 0, 1. 0, 1 means in the interval between 0 and 1, inclusive of n points. The race to n means you have n such numbers. So I have n inputs. Each one is between 0 and 1. And the output is a real number. So that's what that r means. r is for real numbers. And the only assumption I'm going to make on this function is it's continuous. Right? Continuous is, again, mathematicians would cringe at this, but think of some function that I can draw on a piece of paper without lifting my pen. As simple as that, right? So I, I shouldn't be able to lift my pen. It's all nice and continuous. The other assumption we'll make is that I'm given some other function, sigma, which is fixed. And it's, it has really almost no assumptions, except that it's nice and continuous. It's bounded. That means it can only give me values between two ranges. It can never go below the lower bound and more than the upper bound. And it's not constant, right? Constant functions are boring. I can do nothing with constants. So two ingredients, the function I'm trying to approximate and there's this special function sigma that is fixed. As long as it's continuous, not a constant, and bounded between two values, I can do something pretty remarkable. This was actually a major result in the, I think, 1950s, and then it's been um, improved over time. And the result is basically, given these two ingredients, I can find the weights on the edges in the neural network. So the Ws are the weights that go from the input layer to the hidden layer. The u's are the weights that go from all the neurons in the hidden layer to the output layer. The n is the number of nodes I put in the hidden layer. And the b is basically a proxy for the threshold. Remember, we said every node has a threshold. Um, technically, b is called a bias. It's negative the threshold. But basically, it plays the role of a threshold. Right? So I can find these weights, thresholds, and an appropriate number of neurons so that this function f so this says absolute value of the error, which is the value of the function I'm trying to learn, minus this is basically the output of the neural network, can be made smaller than epsilon, where epsilon is some number you choose. So it's saying given a reasonable function f, I can use my neural network to make the error between the output of the neural network and the function as small as I want, which is good news. Right? This means I can construct neural networks and learn any function I want. Um, and that's what we want to do. That's the function we want to approximate, that the function is the rules for the system. So now there are two disclaimers here. The first one is that you can't have 
what's called a linear function. That activation, the sigma, the bounded non-constant function, it can't just be a constant. It, uh, it can't just be uh, linear, and we'll see what linear means. The other one is nothing is free, right? So I said you can approximate that function to arbitrarily high accuracy, but there's a price you pay. The price is if you want to make that accuracy even smaller, that epsilon even smaller, you have to add exponentially more nodes in the hidden layer. So if you want an accuracy of one, maybe I need 100 nodes. If you want an accuracy of 0.1, you might need 1,000 nodes or 10,000 nodes, right? It can grow exponentially. And that, of course, has computational costs, storage costs, learning costs. It takes more time to learn. So again, summarizing what our neuron looks like now, it still has n inputs. It still has weights. You still take a weighted sum. But instead of sending, remember we were doing the thresholding compared to a threshold 0 and 1s. Instead of that, you feed it to this nonlinear activation function here, the sigma. Right, so you take this weighted sum, you feed it to sigma, it gives you some number, that's the output. So I said, you know, the activation function cannot be linear. What does linear mean? Linear means in one dimension it's a straight line. So it's a function of the form C1x plus C2, right? It does nothing. If you plot it, it's a straight line. In two dimensions, it plots a, a plane. In three, it's a hyperplane and so on. Um, and the, the reason you don't want a linear function is because of this technicality, which is if you give me a number, I apply a linear function to it. Then I apply another linear function to it. Maybe a third linear function to it. It has no effect. I just keep getting a, a linear function as the output. Or more formally, if I'm given two input functions, f and g, which are both linear, and I compute this. This basically means take x, apply the function f to it, and then apply the function g to it. And what you get is something like even x plus e2, where even and e2 are constants. So really, there's no point in trying to take these linear functions and put them one after the other one. You might as well use one. And so you want something that's nonlinear, which is not like that. It's not a simple function. And you have seen nonlinear functions all the time. Square roots, logs, exponentials, powers of like monomials, right? X raised to 55 is not linear. And the reason, you know, the abstract reason why you want nonlinear functions is Almost every system that we work with is nonlinear, right? It's not straightforward. It's doing the square root of something, the log of something, you, something more complex. So this is now notation because if you do any work in deep learning, you'll see this everywhere, right? This, this is linear algebra. It just shows up everywhere. And often people who are trying to actually get into deep learning or machine learning get stuck because they see notation that's not familiar. This, I, I don't know what this is. This sounds too fancy, but it's not. It's just notation. So instead of writing the, the linear sum there, uh, w1, w2, all this stuff, you often write it in the shorthand. And what w is, it's a vector. What i is, it's a vector. w is the weights vector, which looks like this, w1 through wn. i is the input vector, which looks like i1 through in. Just put them you know, in a Python list, basically or NumPy array, and you do a dot product between them, which is what this is. The T stands for transpose. Transpose takes a column, turns it into a row, or takes a row, turns it into a column. So what this says is it says, take my weights vector, turn it into a row, take my input vector, which is a column, take the dot product, right? If you use NumPy, np dot dot, and you add the, the bias term to it. Again, bias is a proxy for threshold. Right? So it's a constant term, you add that to it. And that's my output. You feed that to a nonlinear activation, and that's my output. And so now, you know, the natural question is, sure, I want some activation function. Which one should I pick? How should I pick one? Do I just, like, make one up? So what constraints do we have? It has to be nonlinear. It should ideally be simple to evaluate computationally. You don't want something very complex. Uh, it, of course, has to be... It actually, technically, you can relax the fact that it's bounded. It doesn't have to be bounded. But it has to be nice and continuous. Um, and you, we'll see later that we need derivatives of this function. So the derivatives are hopefully easy to evaluate, the first derivative. And so again, going back to what we said initially, 
we were doing a binary switch, right? We were saying, take this weighted sum plus the bias. If it's less than the threshold, it's, it's less than zero, then it's zero. If it's more than zero, then it's one, right? So the bias term basically says, instead of a threshold, you can compare to zero. And so that's, the, that's what the shape looks like, but it's not very useful, because the derivatives are zero everywhere except at one point. And so if the derivative is zero, as we'll see, we need that information. Without that, I really can't do much with this. I can't train a neural network. I say, all right, um, maybe I can cheat a bit. Maybe I can like, make it smooth and nice and continuous. And so it looks like this S-shaped thing. It's called the sigmoid function, which is also used in logistic regression, for example. And you can think of the sigmoid as just a continuous, nice, smooth version of the binary switch. Right? Instead of saying zero or one, you say, yes, it is zero when you go to the left. It is one when you go to the right. But in the middle, it, it has a smooth interpolation between zero and one. And the nice property that this function has is if you compute the first derivative, which is listed here, the prime means the first derivative, you can rewrite the first derivative in terms of the function itself. That's generally not true, but again, imagine if you are evaluating this function billions of times, then you don't want to evaluate two functions. So you can just evaluate sigma x and reuse that to compute the first derivative. So it has very nice properties and it was used a lot in every single neural network till maybe three, four years ago. Now there are better choices. So what choices are there? One is something that looks almost the same. It's called the hyperbolic tangent, but it varies between minus one and one. Then there are you know, all kinds of fancy names. This is called a ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit. I mean, it's simple, right? If x is negative, it gives me zero. If x is positive, it gives me x back. But this is used a lot now because it's very easy to evaluate. You're doing nothing, just comparing to zero and returning the value if it's greater than zero. And then there are modifications of that. Someone said, and this is not very rigorous, right? So someone sat down and said, you know, this is interesting, but when x is zero or less than zero, I always get zero back. Eh, maybe I shouldn't get zero back. Maybe it should give me something back with a different slope. So you add two lines, right? You just change the slope of the left part. Then someone else came and said, yeah, but that's too, uh, it's, it's not continuous at zero. I want something else. I want something smooth. So it's, I forget what this is called, exponential ReLU or something like that, right? So there's a smooth version of that. And there's no science here. Right? There, there are tricks. People do engineering. They, they look at what the training process is doing, and they say, maybe I can tweak this. Maybe I can tweak that. And that's OK. Right? I, as far as we know, there's nothing very deep here. It's a choice you make. Uh, it's dictated by the kind of problem you're solving sometimes. It's dictated by computational efficiency. Um, and you often get very weird behavior during training, which we won't go into. And so, well, I'll tell you one, which is many of the nodes in, the, in your neural network die. Right? They, they, the weight becomes so low that they always give you zero, and I can't do anything with that. So then people choose a different activation function. Uh, so to summarize, we basically started with a neuron. We generalized it. We said it takes n inputs, takes a weighted sum, feeds it to this nonlinear activation function. It can be the sigmoid. It can be hyperbolic tangent, something else. Outputs a number, that's a neuron. If I put many of them in a network together, then that's a neural network. And we can uh, approximate any function to arbitrarily high accuracy with this weird method that we created. Um, so this is, again, uh, some notation, but it's very useful. The input, inputs are i1 through i4. And now we have A1, A2, A3, which are the values at the three intermediate neurons. As before, they are the weighted sum plus the bias fed to an activation function in all three. The only difference is each node has its own weights. Each node has its own bias. So that's why you have these subscripts. You have one, two, three, one, two, three. You get three numbers at A1, A2, A3. And then you say, okay, what next? I have an output which takes the, the value at A1, A2, A3 takes a weighted sum, adds a bias, returns that to me, right? So, yeah, please. The network always looks like a tree? So it's not a... Repeat, repeat. Uh, oh, yeah. So the question is, does the network always look like a tree? Yes. 
And, and that's not the case. There are other architectures like recurrent neural networks which have loops, but there are other training issues that crop up. But for sequential data, time series, language, what you use nowadays are um, a sequential, uh, recurrent neural networks. Yeah. But this is still for almost every vision task, for example, recognizing objects, uh, you know, what's used in self-driving cars, for example. It's basically this architecture with some modifications. And so one more layer of abstraction and notation. So we use vectors, and they can be collected in a matrix. So this is the shortest way to actually work with a neural network. You have your inputs, which is a vector. You multiply it by a matrix. A matrix has n rows and m columns, and you can think of it as something that maps the, an m-dimensional, actually, I shouldn't say n and m, they sound the same. It's an A row by B column matrix, a box, and it takes something with B dimensions and maps it to something with A dimensions. So you should think of a matrix as something that takes a vector and maps it to another vector in a linear way with different dimensions. So if I want to send a three-dimensional vector to a 10-dimensional vector, I would multiply it by a 10 by 3 matrix. And so what this says is it says, give me an input, which is, let's say, four dimensions, multiply it by a matrix. That takes that input to the hidden layer, right? And so now it might have five dimensions, five nodes. Apply the, add a bias to every element in the vector. Apply an activation function. Good. Now I'm sitting in the hidden layer where the activation function is applied. I have a vector. Multiply that by another matrix. That takes me to the output. I might have one output. So it takes me to a number. I might have 15,000 outputs. It takes me to a 15,000 element vector. And add another constant bias to the whole vector. Right? So the, by constant bias, I don't mean C is added to every element in the row. C is a vector, too. So you can imagine implementing this in, you know, I don't know, NumPy. Right? It's one line, very simple. Of course, the trick is, I don't know what V and W and B and C are. Right? So a lot of the work is, that we'll do is uh, how to find them efficiently. So think of a neural network, at least in this architecture, a tree type one, as multiply by a matrix, add a, add a bias vector, apply a nonlinear function, repeat. So fine, I have this network, what do I do now? Right? This, is, this is very theoretical, I don't know what to do with this. So here's a practical example of how you would really do something. You would get a bunch of images, right? So a bunch of cute animals. Each one has a name, so you have labels. So you know, okay, this image is an elephant. This image is a dog. This image is a cat. You would feed this to your neural network. So you would take, so one of the, as a side note, one of the really powerful things about neural networks is classically, if I gave you an image, I said, can you tell me if this is a dog or a cat? Algorithmically, right? Not, not humans. You would have to do very specialized things like, can I pick out ears? Can I pick out like shapes? Can I write these special algorithms by hand to pick out all these shapes in a robust way? But neural networks don't need that. You give it pixel level information. If there's a 10 by 10 image or a 10,000 by 10,000 image, you actually give the raw pixel values and it figures things out. So you don't really have to do any pre-processing except for some minor steps like scaling. Just feed this thing in and it, it figures out what to do. So you take the images, you feed it to your neural network at the pixel by pixel level, you do the so-called forward propagation, you make a prediction using your network. So again, same as before, I has all the pixels, so it can be a huge vector. This is, for now, an unknown weight matrix, so you randomly initialize it. Add this bias, randomly initialized, feed it to the activation function, multiply that by another weight matrix, add another bias, all the weights and biases are randomly initialized. Right? We don't know what the values are, we just do something. And you get an output. The output might be, is, what's the probability that this image is a cat? Right? That's an example of an output. If you're doing a regression problem, predicting house prices, it might say the price of you know, this person's house is $10,000. So what do I do with the output? Well, I have to compare it to something. I know what the answer should be. I know this image is a cat because you gave me labeled data. So I compare it to that. And so the output is O, 
So O is what we predict using the neural network. The actual value is V, right? So cat, dog, and so on. And I need a way to compare these two. So there's something called a loss function, right? So it's called the cost or the loss. And in this case, it's a very simple one. It says, well, you're predicting a number. I know what number I should get. Let me subtract and square them. If they agree, then I'll get zero. So I have no cost or so no loss. If they disagree, the more they di disagree, the more this number grows. So if you had to predict 10,000 and you predicted a billion, of course, that's a huge number, 10,000 minus a billion squared. But if you had to predict 10,000 and you predicted 10,001, great, that's very accurate, and this would give me one or half in this case. And so what I want to do is I want to take all my data, feed it to my neural network, make predictions, use my loss function to compare my predictions to the actual output I expect. And then I want to tweak the weights and biases, right? The Ws and the Vs and the Bs and the Cs. Because we initialize them randomly. So that's, of course, not going to work. So can I come up with a way to change those in a smarter way so that this loss function goes down? If I can minimize this loss function, great, right? I make accurate predictions. So in a nutshell, that's the game. Find the Vs, Ws, Bs, and Cs that minimize this loss function. And that process is training, right? So all this stuff about GPUs, distributed computing, all that effort is going to find these parameters. That's it. Once you find them, you really don't need much. So this is the whole game in a nutshell. You have a bunny. You know the value is a bunny. You make a prediction. What, it, what your neural network says is it's a polar bear. Say, okay, I'll use my loss function, doesn't agree. Let me change the values and see if I can make the output be bunny. So we need loss functions, right? So any questions till now? I know this is like dense stuff, at least some of it is, but the takeaway at this stage should be, I have this thing that someone invented. It's basically repeating the same calculation again and again. It has some parameters the weights and the biases that I don't know. And I want to find out the weights and biases that minimize my um, miscalibration between predictions and the, the, the actual outputs. And so the question is, how do I measure the difference between my output and my prediction? And often the way that is done is you treat each example, each piece of input data independently. So that's what this sum means. The sigma is sum over every single data point that you have, i equals one to n, and for each piece of data, compute a difference between the prediction, which is y with that funny hat, and the actual value, which is y. So give me the actual label, prediction, compute a cost or loss, and that's some number that's greater than zero most of the time, and add it all up. And I want to bring that down. So how do I choose that c? Right? So I say, okay, I'd reduce the problem a bit. Instead of trying to come up with a loss function for all the data at once, I have to do it for one example. Great. But how do I actually choose what that, that function should be, what C should be? So the simplest one you can pick is mean squared error, what we saw before, which is prediction minus the actual value squared. Why do you square it? Because you want it bounded below by zero. If it's not you know, the minimum that you should hit is zero, which is exact prediction. And any deviation from that should only go up. So you put the square. You can put absolute values, but they, you know, it's not differentiable, all that stuff. So this works. What happens if, so that works very well for regression problems. Regression is predict a number, right? So predict house prices, predict the stock value, um, predict memory usage. It works extremely well for that. What happens if my problem is different? It's binary classification, which basically means I'm predicting one of two categories. You give me images, and I want to tell you if it's a cat or a dog. You tell me whether I should, uh, this is a random example. Given the state of the world, I run a military base. Should I fire a missile or should I not fire a missile? Is my email spam or not spam? Right? Binary decisions like that are called binary classification problems. So what you're predicting is class zero or class one. 
or what you often predict is a probability. You say the probability that you sh this email is spam is 0.9. The probability this email is spam is 0.1. And then you put a threshold. You say 0.5, 50%. If you predict the probability of something is more than 50%, then I'll say it's in class one. If you say it's less than 50%, I'll say it's class zero. And one way to measure how well you're doing is to look at accuracy, right? So I make a prediction of probabilities. I put a threshold 0.5. Anything more than that is one. Anything less is zero. <clears throat> and I just count what percentage of my predictions are correct. You gave me 10,000 emails. I said 3,000 are spam. How many of those did I get right? And how many of the non-spam emails did I get right? Maybe I made 70% correct predictions. Can I use that to basically measure my loss, my cost? And of course, in this case, you don't want it to be zero. You want it to be 100, but similar idea. And the answer is you really don't want to do that because, one, your accuracy is a function of your threshold. If you pick 50%, you'll get one answer. If I pick 45%, I'll get a different answer. There's no real reason why you should pick 50%, right? I mean, we like 50%. It's midway. But there's really no reason that should be the number. Maybe it's 10%. Who knows? So one, it's dependent on this threshold, and you don't want that dependence. That just adds complications. Two, accuracy is very discrete. Right? If I change the underlying weights and biases of my neural network, it's very hard to know how the accuracy will change, because it will change the probabilities in a continuous way. But even if I change the probability of something from 0.4 to 0.41, the accuracy doesn't change. So it's, it's too indirect. So you don't use accuracy at all. You say, OK, maybe what I should do is the probability is between 0 and 1. My class is class 0 or class 1. Let me just subtract and square the mean squared error. But y is either 0 or 1. And p is a number between 0 and 1. p is a probability. Eh, let me just subtract, square them. That should work. And it actually works. Right? So it, it sounds weird, but this works. The reason it sounds weird is you're comparing a discrete object, 0 or 1, to a continuous probability between 0 and 1. It doesn't really make sense. But sure, it works in practice. The problem with this is if you get a prediction right, you of course get 0. Right? If the class is 1, y is 1, and you predict your probability is 1, perfect. 1 minus 1 is 0. But what if you predict the wrong thing? What if an email is spam, and you should be predicting 1, but you predict 0? So you got it completely wrong. You said it's not spam. In that case, this gives you 1 minus 0 squared, which is 1. So the worst that this can get is 1. And that's not hard enough. right? That you want the, the teacher to be extremely strict, and this is not strict enough for the neural network. It doesn't impose a heavy penalty when it misclassifies something. So then you go to mathematics, right? You go to probability. And you say, OK, what's the likelihood, or in this case, what's the probability that if my neural network predicts p, I get class y? And I'll go a bit quick through this, because there are too many details. But the basic idea is you can write the probability as p raised to y times 1 minus p raised to 1 minus y. Right? So if your y is 0, if you're in class 0, then this term just dies. Anything raised to 0 is 1. So I get 1 minus p. Yes, the probability of belonging to class 0 is 1 minus p. If y is 1, then the second term dies. right? Then the second term has an exponent 1 minus 1, which is 0. So if y is 1, I just get p. So of course, that makes sense. When y is 1, I get p. When y is 0, I get 1 minus p. So this is a compact way of writing the probability of getting the value y when the prediction of the neural network is p. Now, likelihoods of probabilities multiply. If you have independent samples, you can multiply the probabilities. And so you say, OK, I have this huge data set. Let me multiply all these likelihoods. Each example has a label yi. Each example has a prediction pi. Let me compute this thing for each thing. Let me multiply them together. And I want to maximize this. So this technique is called max likelihood. It's used everywhere in statistics and machine learning, which is let me build a model that maximizes my probability of predicting the right thing. 
So you want to maximize this. As soon as you get to this point, you say victory. You know, minimizing and maximizing is essentially the same thing, tack on a minus sign. So if I get to the point where I need to maximize something, I can turn that into a minimization problem, except you do a few tricks. You say, let me take the logs, because logs take products and convert them to sums. So now we get something that looks like sum over the cost of each example, which is what we wanted. But I still need to, you know, log is technically a monotonic function. So if I have to maximize something, it's equivalent to maximizing the log. Can I turn that into a minimizing problem? Yes, put on a minus sign. Maximizing a function f is the same as minimizing the function minus f. So you say, all right, I don't need to worry about this. Just put a minus sign in front, which is right here. And you get this weird looking thing. And we'll try and understand what that actually does. But you say, I'm going to maximize that thing. The y's are fixed. The y's are the labels that you gave me. So I can't do anything about the y's, 0 or 1. But the p's are the things that I'm predicting, the probabilities. And I want them to be the right ones. So when you get something messy like this, it looks scary, right? You just take it apart, just break it down. And you'll often see that when you stare at something like this for long enough, it becomes very intuitive, right? It almost becomes obvious. But when you first see it, you say, who came up with this? And so let's see what happens. Let's say my label is one, right? The image is a cat, and that's one by definition for us. And so if I put y equals 1, the second term completely dies out. 1 minus 1 gives me 0. This term just drops away. So that's a good sign. If y is 1, I just need to worry about this thing, which is log p, because y is, you know, it disappears. So I say I get if y is 1, then the likelihood is minus log of the probability of predicting that thing. If y is 0, then the first term dies out. The second one gets 1 minus 0, which is 1. So if y is 0, I just get minus log 1 minus pi. OK, that's simpler. Right? It's just log of the probability or log of the 1 minus the, the probability. So what happens if y is 1 and I predict that correctly? So y is 1 and pi is 1. In that case, I get minus log of 1. Log of 1 is 0. I get 0, so good. If I predict the right thing, my loss is 0, as it should be. What if I predict completely the wrong thing? So y is still 1, but pi is 0. In that case, I get log of 0, or negative log of 0, which blows up. That's infinite. Right? So log of numbers less than 1 is negative. And as you approach 0, it starts going to infinity. So this is much stronger. When I make the wrong prediction here, my loss blows up. It's infinite. <clears throat> What happens in the other case when y is 0? Basically the same thing. When you predict the right thing, your loss is 0. When you predict the wrong thing, your loss blows up. So the key thing here is this is motivated by probabilities and likelihoods. And so it's meaningful. And it's something that gives you 0 when your predictions are right. And it gives you something that's infinite when your predictions are wrong. And it smoothly goes from 0 to infinity. We won't go through this, but it's the same thing. And that the, the meta point I want to make is if you are interested in deep learning or machine learning and you look at things like this, never get intimidated. Don't think this is, you know, this is not to win a Fields medal. Just take it, decompose it, look at each term. It takes some time. It's like reading a very complex function in C. Might take time, but you'll figure it out. Same thing here, looks messy, but you see the same structure. This is the case when you're predicting not two classes, but 10,000 classes, 1,000 classes. It's called multi-class classification. That's the same thing, basically. It looks at the logs of the probabilities that you're predicting. And really, you can write your own loss function. Right? Now, you can't write anything. It has to have these simple properties. It should be ideally bounded below by 0. Uh, it should increase smoothly the worse your predictions get. But really, people design their own loss functions based on the problems they work with. So another one is something called the kullback leibler divergence, which compares two probability distributions. That's used for visualization problems. So it really depends. But mostly, if you're entering deep learning and you're trying things out, what you'll end up using are the, the commonly used ones. <clears throat> 
So all that is theory, right? Like, what did we do till now? We came up with this neuron thing. We said it works very well. If I put them in a network, I can approximate any function I want. I then have to design this loss function. It has all this weird stuff in it. Then I'm going to minimize this and find the right weights. That's OK. Like, that, that you need that to actually work with these things. But let's try and get some intuition for why they actually work. So one way to get intuition is to pick a very simple problem. Right? If you can't solve a simple problem, you can't solve a hard problem. So the very simple problem we pick is you have these two regions, the red dots and the green dots. Every point has an x and y coordinate. It has two numbers. Anything that's in the center is class 0. Anything that's in the green ring is class 1. And I want to come up with a way to take the x, y coordinates of a point. You give me the x and y from this plane. And I want to tell you whether you're red or green. So red is 0, green is 1. And of course, a human being will look at this and say, ah, that's easy. Look at the radius right, from the center. If it's less than, I don't know, 1, you're red. If it's more than 1, you're green. Done. Right? I don't need all this stuff. But what if you are an algorithm? Either I can write that logic myself, right? I can say square root of, or x squared plus y squared, or square root of x squared plus y squared. There's a threshold. But I don't want to hard code a threshold, generally. I want to learn that. And so this is, uh, again, we won't go too much into it, but there's a very nice technique for these kinds of classification problems called logistic regression. And it does very, something very simple. It takes the input data, x and y, it computes that linear combination, ax plus by plus c, and feeds it to the sigmoid function, and it predicts a probability. You give me a point, I'll tell you the probability if it's 0 or 1. And it, these are familiar things. We just looked at sigmoids. This is the same uh, log likelihood thing that we worked through. It basically tries to minimize this, but it doesn't have these hidden layers and all that stuff, right? It just takes the numbers, feeds it to a sigmoid, predicts a probability. <coughs> this is a sigmoid again, and you can see why you can treat this as a probability. It, a sigmoid gives you a number between 0 and 1. Yeah, that's a probability for our purposes. And we'll make a simple decision. We'll say anything that's more than 50% probability is class 1. Anything that's less than 50% is class 0. Let's make life simple. And so the question is, what is that boundary, right? Where do I actually make the decision that something is in 1 and something is in 0? Where does it cross that 50% boundary? And the answer to that for a sigmoid function is a sigmoid function is, one, is uh, 0.5 every time its input argument is 0. Right? So a sigmoid is very simple. It will predict a probability of 50% when its input argument is exactly 0. And when is that 0? Well, in our case, we have two inputs. So we have x and y. So when some number times x plus some number times y plus c is 0, I get a 50% probability. So if you have built logistic regression models, that's called a decision boundary. And ax plus by plus c equals 0 is geometrically something very nice. It's a straight line. right? So you get this equation of a straight line. Which means if I fit a logistic regression model to this data, I get that straight line. It says anything below that straight line is green. It says anything above that straight line is red. So this is horrible. It's 50% accurate. All the yellow stuff is things I got wrong. And so clearly, this doesn't work. Or in other words, logistic regression is used when you can separate your data with a line or a plane or a high dimensional plane. Of course, it doesn't work. So as we said before, you can, of course, say, let's pick the radius. That would work. But this is two-dimensional data. What if I have you know, 10,000-dimensional data? I can't see it. Right? We can't visualize even four dimensions. So of course, you want something that's more automated. So we'll use our neural network. We'll minimize the, the log likelihood. It's also called the cross entropy. We'll minimize that loss function, that complex-looking thing. And uh, we'll predict a probability. Let's see what happens. So what do we expect will happen? Right? So what we can do is just stare at this for some time and say, OK, I have x, I have y. I do something that looks like w1x plus w2y plus b. And I feed that to a sigmoid. We just looked at this. 
I know that number is 50% when this argument is zero when I am on a straight line. The same thing happens for the second neuron. It has its own decision boundary. So every neuron is drawing its own line. It, the first neuron says, I'm going to draw my line. The second one says, I don't like you. I'll draw my own different line. The third one will draw its own. So you'll end up with three lines, one for each hidden node. So what if I have one hidden node? Well, it draws one line, that blue line. And it says everything to the upper left, upper right is green. Everything below that is red. I can add two nodes, right? So these are the number of nodes in the hidden layer. I keep increasing them. If I add two, I get two lines, OK? So everything to the top left and the bottom right is correct. They're all green. In the center, all the red is correct. But what it's doing is it's saying anything between those two lines is red. So of course, it gets these two yellow regions completely wrong. Draw a third line. Now it gets everything right. Because the three lines, basically, each one, I, I, I'll use this word loosely, each one cooperates and says, I can isolate that red region by drawing three, three lines. So anything that's between us is red. Anything that's not between us is green. So one line didn't work. Two lines worked better. Three lines is perfect. I can add five nodes, so I get five lines. Of course, it's not useful at this stage. They're just trying to box in that red region. I can add 10, same thing, right? So beyond a point, it doesn't really matter. You have perfect performance. Adding more nodes really does nothing. And so what's going on here, right? What happens when you draw one line? Remember, we said that line is the line where the probability is 50%, right? So that line says, if you are on me, then I'm going to output 50%, 0.5. So as you go to the bottom left, that 50% goes to 100%. So that's the arrow that says, so the arrow that says node goes to one. If you walk in the other direction, your value goes to zero. So that one node says, I care about nothing else. If you are on my line, then I'll give you a score of 0.5. If you walk in that direction, I'll give you zero. If you walk in that direction, I'll give you one. What does, so in this case, you have two lines. The line is doing the same thing, the orange line. It's saying 0.5, 0 in that direction, 1 in that direction. And so we introduce a new coordinate system, basically. We say everything that's above the line is c equals 1. Everything that's below the line is c equals 0, right? Of course, the other line says, I have my own coordinate. Everything that's above me is d equals 0. Everything that's below me is d equals 1. So each line is dividing the whole region into two pieces, and it's assigning labels of 0 or 1 to each piece. And you can combine them, right? You say, OK, so what's happening in the top left region is c is 1, d is 0. One line said <clears throat> you are 1. One line said you are 0. In the center, both lines said you are 0. Below that, both lines said one said you are 0, one said you are 1. And this can be thought of as a different coordinate system. So the nodes are basically saying, I don't like x and y. I'll work in the c and d space. That's the one I like. And one of them happens to be mixed. It has red and green points, but two of them are pure. So what's going on is each hidden node puts a line and divides the whole input space into two categories, two regions. So if I put n binary, n uh, hidden nodes, I'll get two raised to n regions. So I get an exponential number of regions. And of course, if I divide it into enough regions, I'll get these pure segments. Some, some will be purely green. Some will be purely red. And so the idea is keep increasing n. Right? So if you give me an image classification problem, I'll give it n equals 10. So I get 1,024 regions. And that might not work. So I keep increasing this. Eventually, I'll do well. Another way to look at this is when I feed in the x and y coordinates, each node gives me 0 or 1. So I get a tuple of n coordinates, each one being 0 or 1. So the x, y gets mapped to these n numbers, and they're 1 or 0. And what does that geometrically look like? One number between 0 and 1 is an interval. 
two numbers between zero and one is a square in two dimensions, you can plot it. Three numbers between zero and one is a cube. N numbers is what's called a hypercube. Can't visualize it, but it's our N dimensional cube. And so you're doing a coordinate transformation. You're saying X and Y is not what I want to work with. I want to work with these new coordinates. And that's what, that looks like this. So on the left side, you have the original data, the red and the green points. You have the C and D coordinates. The neural network transforms that into a C and D space. And remember, they were all zeros or ones. So you fall along the edges of the square. So everything here is on two edges of the square. If you look closely, you will see that this region in the center, which is this part, has both green and red points. So this red stuff gets mapped to this red circle. The stuff on the top gets mapped to this green ellipse here. The stuff on the bottom gets mapped to this ellipse here. So the neural network is taking your data and saying, I don't like it the way it is. I'm going to transform this. Right? I'm going to put this in a new coordinate system. And then remember, we always have a hidden node, a hidden neuron at the end, and that acts like logistic regression. It says, okay, I'll forget about the original data, I'll work with this new data that you gave me on the right. Can I draw a line to separate the reds and the greens? So it makes this feeble attempt to draw this, this, uh, why is this not working? So it draws this line right here. It says anything above that line is class zero, anything below that is class one. Clearly, it doesn't work very well in this case. But remember, when we added three lines, we had perfect predictions, right? These three lines took the red and boxed it in. What that means is in three dimensions, you get a, you get a cube. All the green stuff gets thrown on the edges, right? So they all go across a cube. But the red stuff gets pushed to one corner. So the neural network basically is saying, I like this coordinate system, because here I can put all the red stuff in one corner, all the green stuff everywhere else, and then the output neuron says, can I draw a plane instead of a line, because this is three-dimensional, can I draw a plane to isolate the red? And it can, right? So it draws a plane, cuts the red stuff off, and the plane says, anything below me is red, anything above me is green. So the takeaway here is a neural network can be thought of as something that transforms your data into a different space to try and use something simple, like logistic regression to separate it. Now, it's not technically logistic regression, it's a different loss function, but basically, at its core, that's what it's doing. Now, that's a very simple classification example, right? So we, the takeaway there is the number of hidden nodes you have, if you have one hidden layer, is the, so, Two raised to that number is the number of regions that you divide your input space into. Or another way of saying that is, you basically take your input data and transform it to an n-dimensional space in the hope of easily separating the two classes. That's what it's doing. Except we don't have to tell it how to do the mapping. It learns that. Right? It, it tweaks the weights to learn that mapping. The other problem that's often seen is regression. Predict a real number. So again, pick the simplest possible example. You have sine x. If I give you x, can you tell me what sine x is? Of course, you can exactly compute this, but we want to see if it works on this. If it doesn't work on this, this is a bad technique. Who cares? And so again, same architecture. The only thing that changes is at the output, instead of all that fancy log stuff, we just do mean squared error my value that I predict, the actual value subtract square. Just use that, and um, yeah, let's see what happens. So again, you want to first look at the network and say, what would it do? So in this case, we have only one input. There's only x. So what does this do? It takes x, it multiplies it by a number w1, adds a bias, feeds it to a, sigma, a sigmoid function. And the decision boundary, remember, is where this gives me 0.5, right? Where it changes from below 0.5 to above 0.5. And in this case, the decision boundary is where that expression inside the brackets is zero. Well, when that is zero, I can exactly solve for x, right? I get x is minus the bias over the weight. So what that means is when I'm to the left of x, when my x is less than that value, I get zero. 
As soon as I cross that value, I get one for that one hidden node, for this, the top hidden node. The next one says, I'm going to do the same thing, but with a different weight and a different bias. So it comes up with its own threshold, that x. And the third one will do the same thing. Each one will say, if you're to the left of my threshold, I'll give you zero. If you're to the right, I'll give you one. So what does that look like? Something like this. In this case, you have four hidden nodes. Each one has a value which is plotted here. So this is the value for the third one, value for the first one, and so on. Each one, when it crosses that boundary, goes from on to off or off to on. So it goes from zero to one or one to zero. So here's an example, right? Like I just made up something. These are the four boundaries. What this vector says is which nodes are on and which are off. So this means node one is on, Node two and node, nodes two and three are off, they're zeros, and node one is on. And when I cross this boundary, it's delta three, it's the one for the third node. When I cross that boundary, the third node goes from off to on, it goes from zero to one. When I cross the next boundary, which is the one for one, then I go to the first node and it's already on, so it turns off goes from one to zero. This one is for the fourth one. So now the fourth one is one, and as soon as you cross the boundary, it becomes zero. And then this is the second one. So the second one goes from off to on, zero to one. So the idea is if I have four hidden nodes, I get four values on my x-axis, and each time I cross one, one of them switches sign. It goes from zero to one, one to zero. And what happens if I take one configuration, right? So in this case, it is, these are the four nodes, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one. And remember, the output is each one gets multiplied by a weight, u1, u2, u3, u4, and a bias gets added. So if I do that, I'll get u1 times one, plus u2 times zero, which is zero, plus u3 times zero, which is zero, plus u4 times one. So I get all the ones add together. I get u1 plus u4 plus d, it's some number. So I get that number. So when I'm to the leftmost side and I start like this, I basically add the corresponding weight. So u1 plus u4 plus d. Then I switch on the third neuron. When I switch on the third neuron, it starts making a contribution. So it takes the old value but adds in a three. So you see u1, u4, d, and a u3. Then I turn the first one off. When I turn it off, that term disappears. So u1 completely disappears from here. And the same thing repeats. u4 disappears, and u2 shows up. So in other words, if I have four hidden neurons, I get five distinct values that my neural network can predict. These are the five values. And its job is to figure out what the u1s and all the u's and the d's are so that it can approximate the function I'm trying to approximate. The general takeaway here, Four hidden neurons, you get five regions. You have n hidden neurons, you get n plus one regions. <coughs> and this is what it looks like, right? So remember x-axis, y equals sine x. I have two nodes in the hidden layer, so I get three distinct values. And you see the green line, which is the neurons turning on. So as you go from the leftmost side, Neuron number one turns on, then neuron number two turns on. And the orange stuff is the actual prediction. So you can actually see each time something turns on, it increases in value. So when you go from the leftmost to the middle region, you see a bump. And then when you go again, you see a bump. Now, of course, you would look at this and say, this is horrible. That's not sign. That yellow curve and the green curve, there's nothing like sign to them. It doesn't work. As a technicality, you see this S-shaped thing. That's the sigmoid. So each time you turn on, you don't discreetly go from zero to one, you go along the sigmoid thing. So, okay, same game. Let me increase the number of neurons. I'll put three. So when I do three, I get four regions, right? There are four horizontal green segments at different levels. It's okay, I mean, towards the right, it's fitting a bit, towards the left, it's not. Four neurons, so five regions. It's getting better. With 10, it 
does it perfectly, right? And if you didn't have the sigmoid the way it is, if you didn't have those S-shaped pieces, it of course wouldn't do this well. It would just be the green line. That's not very good, but the sigmoid helps. It helps you smoothly turn things on and off. So you say, okay, maybe that was too easy. And I should add, a neural network is dumb, right? A human being, if I say sine x, they'll say, I know it's periodic. I know it's defined over all real numbers, and it goes off in both directions, and it's periodic everywhere. That extra information is not given to the neural network. So if I give it a value of 15,000 and say, tell me sine x, it will, give me some, it will give me a number. It won't make any sense, right? So you basically focus on the region of input that's given while training. That's where you want to operate. You don't want to operate outside that. And th that's an open research problem, too. If you had a neural network and you wanted to give it that information, you wanted to say there's a symmetry, there's something more in the data, which is when you increase the argument of sine x by pi, by 2 pi, I get the same value. It's periodic. How would you do that? But in this case, let's pick a slightly harder problem, sine x, but there's a decaying exponential. So if you see, it decreases as it goes from left to right. right? It gets narrower. Can, can I predict this? So two nodes, three regions, no. Three nodes, four regions, no. What about 10? Still not, and you see something interesting. It tries to fit the stuff on the left because the loss on the left is higher. The values are higher, so the losses are higher. So it tries to minimize the loss where it can first. And it says, if I solve this part, my loss decreases dramatically. The one on the right, it's so small, if I get it wrong, my error is small. I don't care. Sorry. Yes? Because it's trying to get the two. Oh, yeah. So the question is, what's happening in the middle? Right? So you have the orange stuff works on the left. It seems to work in the middle. And then you have that, that decrease. But it's not really fitting that well there. And the answer to that is, when you do the minimization, as we'll see, it doesn't actually find the minimum of the loss function. You terminate it somewhere. So if I let it run for more time, it will try and fit that piece better. But what you do in practice is at some stage you say, run n iterations and truncate, stop. So if I let this simulation run for, I don't know, 10 more steps or 10,000 more steps, it would actually keep trying to make the predictions in the center better and forget about the one on the right. And so that's a good point, actually. That happens in all neural network problems. You don't know when to stop the training. So it will keep trying to minimize the loss. At some stage, it starts flattening the, the loss curve. And you say, do I want to keep going? Because sometimes you see this dramatic reduction. But often you just say, OK, I'm happy with this. Done. And if I put enough hidden nodes, then I get with 100, I get 101 regions. And even the green stuff doesn't look like it's straight horizontal lines. There's so many regions, you see, it almost looks like there's some structure there. But this is just putting as many regions as it can and trying to fit a value in each part. And I would like to add that for both these examples, this is, this is not what you would do in practice. right? In practice, you don't say, let me keep increasing the complexity of my neural network till I fit the data. That is called overfitting. It's called memorizing your data set. What you do is you take your data and you split it in two chunks. And you do all this on only one chunk. And when it's done, you make the predictions on the second one, and you see how well you did there. And overfitting is when you did very well on the training data. You did extremely well. And you apply it to the other one, and your performance drops like a rock. Right? You know you did something wrong. You, you memorized the data set. So you want to do it in a way that it generalizes. When you give me some other data, I can still make good predictions. This is just for understanding. So ideally, the way I would do the regression one is maybe randomly sample. Or to make it harder, I would say truncate the x-axis region in two parts that are disconnected. And only train on the left one and see if you can extrapolate to the right. And it won't do very well. right? Like, in this case. But that is, again, the, the idea that a neural network is basically doing these simple operations. 
at its core, but many times, and it has the information about how each piece is operating and it puts it together, that's what basically makes it tick. That's what makes it work. It's much harder or even impossible to do this interpretation when you have real complex data sets. So a, a big problem in uh, deep learning in general is you train this network, your performance is outstanding, even on new data sets, and then the question is, why did you predict this? I want to understand that. So there's a key distinction between prediction and understanding. And if you look at all of science, I mean, a, a typical scientist doesn't care about predictions. Right? That's not interesting. That is a means to get to real understanding. If I can predict and study what model I used to predict, maybe I can understand what's going on in the system. But prediction for its own sake is mostly not that useful, except for small problems, right? I mean, if, I don't know, if my, my apartment building wants to predict when I'll be home and automatically switch on the heater, maybe I don't care. But if it's a self-driving car and it's going to make a left when there's a stop sign, I want to understand exactly how it came to that decision. Why did it do that? And so that's an, apart from some problems, it's an open problem to figure out what a neural network is actually doing. Phew, long, right? Uh, so any questions here? Anything else? Yes. Yes. So that's a very good question. The question is, um, in this case, we first looked at the approximation theorem and said, we can approximate any function, any reasonable function to arbitrary accuracy, but we pay a price, which is if I want the accuracy to go up, I want that epsilon to go down, then I have more and more neurons, exponentially more neurons. And you saw that, right? Like in the regression problem, I had to go to 100. Imagine if it's something more complex, it might be a million. So why? You know, it works. I mean, I can always keep scanning this or do something like binary search and keep increasing and decreasing and see what happens. Um, why do people add more hidden layers, right? Like, wh why does that work? Does that help with the un universal approximation theorem? By adding more hidden layers, can I change that exponentiality to something more well-behaved? And the answer to that is I don't know. And, and that's an open problem in general. There are Depending on the problem, you can come up with heuristics. You can say, okay, this is what the mappings are. So I'll give you an example for image recognition. You use something similar, but with some tweaks called a convolutional neural network. And there what the layers do is they, they learn larger and larger features. And what I mean is if I give it images of cats and dogs and, I don't know, elephants, the first hidden layer will learn something very coarse, like straight lines and curves. The second hidden layer starts learning more complex things like eyes and nose and ears. The third hidden layer starts recognizing faces. The fourth one might actually rec start recognizing whole animals. And so that's what depth does. And so it does help. Uh, it does help to kill that exponential behavior. You don't need to do that anymore. You can just keep adding more. But it comes at a cost. The cost is training becomes much harder. Because as we'll see, when you do training, you have to compute these first derivatives. And when you're doing it backwards, you get all kinds of issues because the derivatives towards the beginning of the network are very small. And the ones towards the end are reasonable. And that slows down training towards the start of the network. There are all these small technical things. Um, but there's a guy at Princeton University, for example, not my relative. His last name is Aurora too. His first name is Sanjeev. No connection at all, but I sometimes get credit for his work because it's a similar name. And, um, and he's doing a lot of work on mathematically trying to understand what depth does. Like, does depth uh, add something to the approximation theorem, basically? But yeah, the short answer is I don't know. I, I don't think anyone really has a tight bound on that. So let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, all right. Um, okay. <laughs>
So we came up with a neural network. We saw what it does intuitively. We said we want to now find the weights, right? The matrices and the biases. So at this stage, let's say we are convinced that this works well. And you say, okay, how do I actually find these weights and biases? I want an efficient way of doing this. Why do I want to find them? Because I want to minimize my loss function. So let's first look at minimizing a function. And that field in general is called optimization or mathematical optimization. And the idea is simple. You have some function with an input x, some value f, f of x, and it's some squiggly thing. And I want to find the x where this takes the smallest possible value. And so that's the minimum, that's the maximum, and some terminology. If you take any function and you find the absolute maximum that it can ever take, right, anywhere in that function's region, that's called the global maximum. It's global. But if I focus on a region of the function, like a small part, I might still see a maximum. I might see a peak. That's called the local maximum. The local maximum in general is not the global maximum. And so the, the eventual problem is to find the global maximum or the global minimum. But sometimes your function is too complex and you have to make do with the local one. And the same definitions apply for minima or minimums. Um, and that's what it would look like, right? So if you were to stand very close to the screen, maybe all you would see is this region in the center. And so you would say, oh, yes, that's my maximum, that's my minimum. But it's local, because you don't know what exists outside. So you step back, you zoom out. And when you zoom out, you say, oh, no, that's the global maximum. That's the global minimum. Can I try and find the global minimum? I'm trying to minimize my loss. Can I find the absolute lowest value that my loss function can take? And so that's training, right? Learning, training is basically, how do I go about minimizing this function? And what knobs do I have? All I can do really is change the, the V and W matrices, right? All the weights and biases. So every neuron has these weights coming in, and every neuron has its bias. Can I change these values in some smart way to minimize the loss? That's, that whole process is training. So all this stuff about GPUs and you know, training on large clusters is eventually to answer that question. You also use this for something called hyperparameter tuning, which is a fancy way of saying the training only helps me with the weights and biases, but the training doesn't tell me how many hidden nodes I should put in. It doesn't tell me what activation function I should use. Those decisions are made by basically putting everything in a loop, right? Saying, try this, try this, try this. And Smart optimization techniques help with that. They say you don't have to do a raw loop, you can do something better. So optimization is bio, it's, it's a fascinating field and it's not restricted to deep learning. We only look at a very tiny slice of it. But optimization is used everywhere, right? FedEx uses it. FedEx says, I have all these packages, I have to deliver to all these people, these are the pairwise distances between everyone, and maybe I want to minimize the time spent or maybe I want to minimize the, the tolls I pay, or maybe I want to minimize the fuel used. And the, finding the solution to that is an optimization problem. So what are the restrictions that we might have? The function we are trying to minimize might be too expensive to evaluate. And if it's too expensive to evaluate, I don't want to evaluate it too many times. So that constrains my technique. The other problem might be that F is discrete. Right? So the traveling salesman problem is a discrete problem. I either go to point one, two, and then three, or I go to three, one, and two. I have six uh, permutations. But there's no notion of smoothness. I can't smoothly change something. I have to just swap two cities. Um, and if something is discrete, I can't take derivatives. If I can't take derivatives, I can't use a whole swath of techniques. That's a restriction. Thankfully, that's not our restriction. Everything is continuous here. A third restriction might be that while you can evaluate your function well, the first derivative might be hard to evaluate. Or maybe you can even evaluate the first derivative, but the second derivative might be hard to evaluate. And so there are techniques that use these higher derivatives that I can't use. And in, in neural networks, you generally use only the first derivative. It's too expensive to evaluate the second derivative, as we'll see. Um, and then the third problem is the function you're looking at might be squiggly. 
right? It's not like a nice ball. If it's a nice ball, I can solve it. But if it has many local minima, many, uh, you know, something called saddle points, a lot of structure to it, then in general, you can't find the global minimum. There's no technique for that. You try. Right? There are smarter strategies for that, but there's nothing that guarantees you the solution, except for running forever. And the last one is the function might be high dimensional. Right? We plotted a one dimensional function. You can visualize it. What if it is a func function of you know, 10,000 variables? I can't visualize it. How do I build techniques that work on that data? So the one that deep learning uses in a dominant way are all versions of gradient descent, right? So there are tweaks to this which work better in practice, but this is at the core. And gradient descent is very, very, very simple. It says, I'm in the, I see this bowl, um, let's see, I see this bowl, and I want to get to the yellow star, that's the minimum. If I'm to the left here, what do I do? I look at my slope, and I say the slope here is negative, I'm pointing down, if my slope is negative, I'm going to move to the right. If I'm to the right where the slope is positive, I move to the left. So it's like being on a hill, right? If you're on a hill and you say, oh, it's sloping down, what do you do? You move forward. If you're on a hill and you're looking up and you say, no, it's sloping up, what do you do? You turn around and you move backwards. And that's what this is. You're standing on a hill here. If you look down, you move in that direction. If you're looking up, you turn around and you move down. That's it. So what do I do? Well. Can I come up with an iterative method? Yes. This x here with the superscript t means this is my value, my position at time t. So I want to come up with something that looks like that update equation. It says start at some position, update it, and get the next position. And the question is, what's update? Well, we just saw that the update is opposite to the slope of, the, to the sign of the slope. The slope is positive, I move in the negative direction. If it's negative, I move in the positive direction. So I say, okay, that means the update should be proportional to my slope, the first derivative, and it should have a negative sign. That's all. And the eta is a parameter that controls how big your step size is. Do I take tiny steps? Do I take huge steps? So it's also often called the learning rate. So if, you, if you're using Keras or TensorFlow or something and you see learning rate, it's basically that parameter that tells me how fast I should move when I minimize a function. And we are running out of time, so I'll show you a few examples. Um, this is a, you know, a simple simulation, right? It's a simple example in Python. It's a very simple chart. It says start here. The learning rate is 0.1, the start point is five, and I just run that update. I calculate the slope, and I move in the, in the direction opposite the slope. And in this case, it nicely converges to the minimum. Great, right? But I increase the learning rate. I said the learning rate is too small. Let me make it large. It's 1.1 in this case. So what happens is it says when it's at the start point, it says I need to move to the right, but it takes this huge step. It actually gets worse. The value increases. Then it says, oh, I need to move to the, to the left. I moved too much to the right. It takes another big step, but it increases the function value again. And it keeps taking these big steps. But because it's big and fat, it can't take tiny steps. It just comes, it goes in the wrong direction. It starts increasing the value of the function instead of decreasing. And so this is an example for why some things in deep learning are so hacky. What learning rate should I pick? Right? If I pick the wrong one, I'm actually not minimizing my loss, I'm maximizing my loss. I don't want to maximize my loss. Um, this is an intermediate example. So instead of a very small learning rate or a very large one, I pick something that's in the middle. And you can see it's still a bit large, so it jumps to the other side of the bowl, but it does converge to, to the minimum eventually. Of course, in real life, you don't have nice functions like that. You have something more complex. So you have two bowls. The one on the right is the global minimum. The one on the left is the local minimum. It's a bit higher. And in this case, I start just a bit to the left of the symmetrical center point, just a tiny bit, right? And when the learning rate is small, it converges, but to the wrong point. I want it to go to the right, but it's sensitive to where you start, and so it goes to the left. If I increase the learning rate, it starts bouncing around. 
right? So it bounces and it's very hard to see from a distance, but it ends here. Not even the minimum, not even the local minimum. If I move a bit to the right, then I get the right answer. It goes to the global minimum. But again, if I increase the learning rate, it actually hops out of that global minimum bowl and goes to the local minimum. This happens all the time in deep learning. Right? You, your cost function is very, very messy. It has so many local minima. And when you start doing this gradient descent, it jumps all over the place and often comes to a local minimum, not a global one. So a lot of the, the tricks that you see and the tuning and all this stuff with deep learning is trying to solve this problem. And this, in general, is another big area of research. How do we train neural networks in a faster way? So people also do things like half precision or even less for the floating point numbers just to speed all this up and say, I don't really care that much about floating point precision. I just want this gradient descent to run fast. So the two key takeaway points here are gradient descent is sensitive to the learning rate and it is sensitive to the start point, except we are not working with one dimensions. You have the, the V matrix, the weights, the W matrix, the weights. These are usually in the hundreds of millions for large neural networks or even billions. So you have billion of, billions of parameters and the biases and the, uh, the, the biases for all the nodes. And you are working in this 10 million, 100 million, billion parameter space. You're doing this search in that huge space. It's very hard to find even a reasonable local minimum. And uh, I'll skip over some of this. So the slides will be available. So please feel free to you know, take a look at this, ping me. I'm happy to explain this stuff. But for very simple problems, you can. So when you have a bowl, you can actually do some mathematical analysis, which you generally cannot, which is how long does it take for me to converge? Right? And you can see in this case, it, depend, it goes as one over the learning rate. So if I make the learning rate very small, then my time increases. If I make it too large, of course, I bounce out. So then this doesn't apply. And so the key thing is, can I tune the learning rate so I don't bounce out, but I don't take too long to converge? And then people have modifications of gradient descent where you say, okay, I want to use prior information of where I was to decide where I should go. I want the learning rate to change over time. And that itself is a, uh, it's a hacky thing, but there are many tricks, uh, tricks of the trade. But I'll stop there. The last thing I'll add is, if you have ever heard of backpropagation, backpropagation is basically a technique to find all the first derivatives. So gradient descent needs the first derivative of the function with respect to what you are tuning. So we need the first derivative of the loss function with respect to all the weights. And to find that in an efficient way, you use something called backpropagation. It means you go forward in, a, in your neural network and you go backwards. And each time you go backwards, you compute the derivatives. And it's a very efficient way of doing that. So you can look at a backpropagation section later too. Well, it's on some simple examples. But uh, I think that's it from me for today. So we have 10 minutes for questions, right? Yeah. Yes. So you've heard of this problem where sometimes you have trained neural networks for recognizing images, and then you can change one pixel, and then the whole thing becomes false. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the question is, neural networks for image classification have this property that I can give it an image of a cat. And it was trained to recognize that as a cat. And I go and I change a few pixels, right? maybe five pixels, one pixel, but very few pixels by small amounts. And to a human being, it still is a cat. You cannot detect that difference. But you can actually change them in a smarter way so that the cat looks like any other category that you want. So if the neural network learned to predict cars, you can actually change it in a way so that it says this is a car. And you can imagine the, the risk with that with self-driving cars, right? You take a stop sign and you do something to it and it says, oh, yield, shoot past. Um, and I think that, the, again, the global answer is people have heuristics for why that happens. And they'll say things like, well, we are learning these high dimensional manifolds and you know, they're jaggedies, things like that, which really don't 
explain the problem away. So we don't know, right? And that's a, a big problem in neural networks is this problem of generalization. Like, can I learn something that is as robust as human beings? There's a trick to, that people use to overcome that. The trick is you say, while training, instead of giving just the image of a cat, I'm going to do these modifications so it looks the same and feed that to the neural network too and it becomes more robust. But in general, yeah, no one knows. So what, what Diane just mentioned, this is, this is the biggest problem which is why you should not use blindly these neural networks. So, uh, for instance, I, I don't know anyone who would actually entrust something like trading systems on some neural network because what, what Sanjay described so far is the very simplest store forward, so forward and backward propagation network in the simplest form. No one for any real purposes using these simple forms. So he mentioned something like CNNs, convolutional neural networks, RNNs, etc. These kind of things exist. They are in use today. They're even more, much more complicated than this, the math behind this. So everyone who knows something, has something like Fourier transform knows this, there's a, this concept of convolution. In convolutional neural network, that gets somehow introduced, which allows us to recognize features regardless where they are. But all of a sudden, you have this complexity in the formula there, where then exactly the problem, as Diane mentioned, happens that if you change something only slightly, you get a completely different output, potentially. The outputs are not linear in any way or form when it comes to the numerical values of the inputs. So with that, you uh, have to really have some checks in, in place if you make, this, make use of these kind of things for anything really serious. So if someone like Google is using this for search results, the worst thing can happen is some nonsense popped up. Everyone has experience like things like Google Translate doing thinks about this, kind of, it's also behind the scenes as your neural networks, and it spits out nonsense for the, uh, for the translations. Fine, but do you trust your life to this? And Probably. generally I would say it's the, the approach is that of security in general. If I have a function and you feed the inputs, then I want to make it robust. In many applications in practice, it's, uh, it's not that sensitive or the user doesn't really have the flexibility to give the input. So in those cases, it's still, they're, they're used heavily. But as soon as you have something like a self-driving car where someone can manipulate the input, then it gets dangerous. So um, one other thing I want to just mention, so we didn't really have time to do these kind of things here. Uh, if you go to my GitHub page, there's a project, a tiny little project on uh, an n.bp, uh, bp, it's called, you can check it out. That's a visualization of neural networks. So it actually can, uh, shows you something, I think you can specify when you recompile it, how many layers it has, how many nodes it has. So you should, you have few of them because uh, I think with two or three of things it actually works. It shows you in a visual way with colors and all these kind of things, how the, how the uh, adding additional uh, nodes work and how the different layers actually work, what they are contributing to recognizing certain features. So it's only something which can help you to get a better grip for this because as soon as you leave the one hidden layer model, which is already, as you showed, we have many, many lines which are intersecting this, it gets complicated. Just imagine what happens when you're getting multiple of these layers in there. So that gets really, really complicated in understanding, and as, as Sanji said, so even those who are actually uh, researching this have not really understood, we have really gotten a grasp of what it actually means and what actually happens at the large scale when this is applied. And what I would add to this is if you're interested in this stuff, right, you want to experiment, uh, there are various levels at which you can enter the field, right? So you don't have to go and learn all the mathematics and then work backwards. So often it is useful to just go to something like Kaggle get a data set, they have a lot of image data sets, and just start training one. So that, I think, is the fastest introduction, which is the mathematics is important, and eventually you do need knowledge of all this. But initially, just getting something, running it, trying experiments, tweaking parameters, and seeing what happens is the fastest way to get familiarity with all this stuff. So that's normally the quickest uh, entry point. Of course, you can go and look at the theoretical work. You can work on the infrastructures. So a great library is PyTorch. Uh, it's from NYU and Facebook guys. So 
personally, I think it's much better than TensorFlow for research especially. So I would say try that or try TensorFlow or you know, make pull requests or something. That also helps you really learn the guts of how these things are implemented. And it's completely up to you where you, where you start. So, and one last thing I want to answer is that uh, Sanjay Jim mentioned at the beginning that, with, uh, that we are using GPUs for these kind of things. So GPUs, just like many other things which came before it, are good at linear algebra. And now we have seen this is pure linear algebra. There's nothing in there. So normally the representation which you saw here is, is the form of matrix vector multiplication. So if you do it with a little bit more complicated things, you actually end up with, uh, with tensor operations. And that's, guess what? Companies like Google have implemented their own hardware for these kind of things. And G uh, GPUs got better over the years, but they're not the most specialized hardware for this. But they're much more specialized in this than a normal CPU itself, which does not perform more than, let's say, even today, um, uh, 64 operations in one single instruction, while something like a GPU can do 1,500 uh, operations in one single instruction, and that's the big difference. There is where the, uh, the performance benefits come from. All right, so any other questions? So you're at the tough ones. I saw about 20% sneak out. Oh, I guess. Right. Thank you for coming. I think. Oh yeah, sure. How to say it? Where are the new masters in AI, uh, like playing games? How do you achieve that? You have like five, let's team, uh, team games, especially. You have like five. How to say it? Like independent uh, networks which cooperate with each other, or does it work differently? How actually you achieve that? Sorry. It's so as far as I know, and I'm not an expert in this at all, um, things like AlphaGo or when they, I don't know about the latest StarCraft one, but they often have two networks playing games with each other. And that's a way of generating more data because you have, I, I don't know if that's your question, but you might have 10,000 games of chess or Go or something and you train two neural networks and then you make them play against each other. And that generates a new data set of, you know, as much as you want, billions of games, and they learn from those. So I don't know about the StarCraft one, for example. Well, yeah, so they're basically the same. So usually you don't have more than one of these systems internally to making the decisions. So uh, what you have with the existing successful ones is similar to what uh, Sanjay suggested is that the problem is the dearth of valuable and fast enough uh, opponents to actually train the system. And what they ended up with, most of the successful systems, is to have a kind of system where they are uh, using genetic algorithms of some sort to uh, change the existing system some way from the current state, creating a set of new opponents, basically. And, and run them against each other, and then pick the best ones and go forward for that. Uh, that, that was for the last, for the last thing, so this, this star, uh, Alpha Star stuff. So for Alpha Go, it was a little bit different in that it simply played the same, yeah, the same algorithm multiple times and had them learn from each other, uh, one, one after the other, and it got simply better over time. The main benefit is simply that you don't have a human involved anymore. And with the last, uh, so the, uh, the last invocation of the basically algorithm which managed to run both Go and chess and also, uh, uh, also some other games in, in the same algorithm really well, they didn't even have to do anything specific to the games. They just had to implement the rules and say, yeah, here and go. And, but this only worked because they could run hundreds and thousands and millions of games against each other. This is where the multiplicity comes in and nothing else as far as I know. And, and there is a general problem. A human being can, <clears throat> like a, a kid, I'm guessing, will look at an apple once and know it's an apple, right? And then they'll remember that. For neural networks, you have to give it tens of thousands of images. For these games, you have to somehow do millions of games. A human being will play an Atari game, a kid, will learn it in probably five minutes. Most yeah, of them are at, the, at the same time, so what Simon mentioned is, 
the learning part, but what became apparent in the last couple of years is that it's even just as important to forget something. If you forgot, uh, learned something which was bad, you had to somehow in the, in, in the future perhaps forget about this because this doesn't immediately go away. So these but, kind of things are... But yeah, I would say like, so that, that's an open problem right now, which yeah. is why do humans learn so fast? And why are, these are too simplistic. So one thing that's missing in everything here is there's no notion of state. So when you feed in one example, and then you feed in another example, the network doesn't know what was fed to it 10 minutes ago. And so recurrent neural networks have some measure of state. So forget gates, or remember gates. And then they can basically reason and say, I saw this 10 minutes ago and this five minutes ago, and so I should do this now. But uh, I mean, a lot of it sounds fancier than it is. When you look at the guts, they're very intuitive ideas. And there's a lot of trial and error. You see what works. And a lot of it is for, for these spectacular successes is just around the efficiency of the implementation and what they can actually run efficiently on the hardware they have and then just let it brute force run for thousands of hours. Right. All right, thank you, yeah. everyone. Thank you, guys.